Thank you. Um, just to make sure, are we recording? Oh, I see the dot. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I am in fact Charlotte Ayton, and um, I'm excited to be here, um, well, this morning, if you're in the Binghamton time zone, to talk to you about um, how orientable smooth manifolds are essentially quasi-groups. Um, so before I get started, I would like to um, post a link to the paper on archive in the chat in case um, I go over something very quickly and you would like to see the actual definition or um, anything like that. Um, and I also think I can keep an eye on the chat here. So if you type something, I will probably see it in real time. Um, yeah, so uh, I'd like to start by saying that um, being uh, close to being done with grad school and applying to jobs, I've become a little bit dramatic. And so um, <laughs> I don't believe this is really uh, false advertising in spirit, but I will say that um, I, I was a little bit provocative in the title of this paper and this talk, and that's all my fault. Don't um, hold my co-author, Simon Yu, responsible for that. Um, I am not going to argue something like the category of orientable smooth manifolds is equivalent to a category of quasi-groups. So, um, okay, so that's not exactly what I'm here to say today. However, I do have the more modest goal of uh, during the next um, 24 minutes now, I guess, um, showing you how to somewhat systematically construct um, all uh, possible um, orientable, triangulable, and dimensional manifolds in a more or less explicit fashion. Um, okay, and so there must be asterisks is, is somewhere in there, but um, I hope that you will believe by the end that I have done something like the big dramatic thing that I <laughs> just said I would do. Um, okay, so um, first of all, Back in the mid 2010s, uh, Mark Herman and John Pachyonathan introduced a functorial construction of closed surfaces from uh, non commutative finite groups. And um, so, if you'll recall, the closed surfaces, um, well, the orientable closed surfaces are um, like the two dimensional sphere, uh, the uh, torus or the donut. Let's see if I can actually handle drawing any of these. So, things like the sphere. Uh, the torus, um, the n hold torus, let's see if I can do n equals 2 at all, so something like this, and so on and so forth. And so uh, Herman and Pachyonathan introduced uh, this construction that took a non commutative finite group and produced maybe a disjoint collection of surfaces like this. Um, and they were triangulated surfaces, and, um, uh, and they studied, they studied um, Essentially, they studied these non commutative finite groups by studying the resulting surfaces from their construction. Um, and so, uh, by the way, full disclosure, um, John Pachyonathan is uh, Semin and I's advisor. So, Semin and I are academic siblings in that sense. And we decided that it would be natural for us to look at the n dimensional generalization of this construction. Um, and so, uh, our motivation, just besides generalizing something, which isn't <laughs> necessarily always a healthy impulse, even though I think we all have it as mathematicians. Um, we, uh, we wanted to actually um, get a systematic way of building um, n-dimensional manifolds, um, assuming that we could understand the appropriate algebraic analog of a non-commutative group. So there were two challenges that we had. Um, one was finding that analog of a non-commutative group and the other one was, uh, and I'll discuss this much more later, desingularizing um, these n-dimensional pseudo-manifolds, which arose um, from the first stage of our generalized construction. Um, and so this first part of the problem is algebra. The second part of the problem is more like topology. And so this is an appropriate thing for bug <laughs> Um So, uh, and we did find that essentially <laughs> every orientable triangular manifold could be manufactured in the manner which we described. So uh, this turned out to work quite well. All right, so first I'll talk about Herman and Pachyonathan's construction, and then I'll discuss quasi-groups. This will essentially be the algebra um, part of the talk and construction. And then I'll discuss the two functors which we gave, which are open serenation and then the actual serenation functor, which um, I claim can uh, produce every 
uh, sort of uh, homeomorphism class of um, triangulable manifold. Okay, so, um, so if we uh, look at this two-dimensional case, we, um, I'll just do this by way of giving an example. So the quaternion group, um, which I'll denote by bold G, um, just as a general algebra thing, I'll write something like G, bold G or underline G, if I'm writing by hand to indicate an algebraic structure like a group, and then G by itself, this plane G will be the underlying set. It's just my uh, notation. And um, so if we take G to be this quaternion group of order eight, which um, consists of um, plus or minus one I, J, and K, where I times J is K, and so forth cyclically, um, as in the quaternions, um, then uh, we can look at all of the pairs of elements um, which don't commute with each other. Um, and we'll call this collection NCT for non-commuting tuples of G, um, an allusion to what we'll see later. Um, this is our notation, not um, Herman and Pachyanathan's. Um, and so for example, um, for example, uh, IJ would be a uh, non-commuting tuple uh, because IJ is K, but JI is negative K. However, um, we would not have, uh, for example, one I uh, would not be a non-commuting tuple because um, one and I do commute with each other in the quaternion group. So uh, we then define collections of input and output um, elements where the inputs are those elements which appear in a non-commuting pair. So it's an element that, that fails to commute with something, or in other words, a non-central element of the group. And the output elements are the images or are the products of um, the pairs of non-commuting elements. So if XY is a non-commuting pair, then F of XY and hence also F of YX would be output elements from our group. And these are the type one and type two vertices of Herman and Pachyanathan. Okay, so um, yeah, in this case we have um, that the non-commuting tuples are all of um, these pairs, plus or minus u, plus or minus v, where u and v are two different elements from i, j, and k. And then our input and output vertices are the same six vertices, essentially every element of the group except for plus one and minus one. And so um, from this data, we're going to manufacture a simplicial complex, which will turn out to be a two pseudo manifold, although, um, okay, so I guess I'll say a two pseudo manifold is basically a triangulation of a two dimensional manifold, except um, there might be singularities in the one skeleton. So for example, um, the pinch torus, if I can draw it here. So if we have a torus where we just take a single um, circle uh, that um, is like homotopic to the circle I drew on the side here. Here, maybe I can draw this even better. Okay, so if you look at this circle around the torus, if I take uh, something that's homotopic to it, like say over here, and I squish that to a point, um, this is a two-dimensional pseudo-manifold suitably triangulated. Um, and so uh, essentially the only singularities that are allowed are n minus two dimensional and lower. And so if this is a two dimensional pseudo manifold that can have singularities that are zero dimensional like this, um, but otherwise it looks everywhere like a two dimensional um, manifold. Okay, so um, the facets of this uh, pseudo manifold that we're going to make are of the form x, y, f of x, y, and here I want to um, separate. Uh, so for instance, if it happened that f of x, y was the same thing as y, um, I still want to treat those as two different vertices. This y is like an input vertex and this f of x, y is like an output vertex. And so they'll still be two different vertices in my simplicial complex, which is why this y is underlined and this f of x, y is overlined. And so um, if we draw this pictorially, um, we would have facets that look like these triangles where this is an input X, an input Y, and an output F of X, Y. And this, this triangle would be a facet in our uh, pseudo manifold or our simplicial complex. Okay. So um, I'll draw a part of this complex. 
So uh, for instance, I might start off with I as an input vertex, J as an input vertex, and then, well, what's I times J? That's K as an output vertex. So then um, there would be another face over here and J times negative I, all underlined, is also K as an output vertex. So these two uh, triangles share an edge here. And then if I keep going around, I'll see that I get this sort of sheet where I multiply minus I by minus J input vertex and I get K again. And then similarly, if I multiply minus J by I in that direction, so there's like an orientation to these, which is where the orientable in the title of this talk comes from, um, then I'll again get the output vertex K. And so um, this square is a part of our simplicial complex. And I won't draw the rest of it, but essentially um, this complex looks like a bunch of copies of this square sheet somehow glued um, together. And, um, and so uh, if we look at the graph below, this is actually um, the induced uh, subgraph or subcomplex of um, the one that I've been describing before, where we just have all of the input type vertices. And if we were to draw out the whole simplicial complex, essentially each of these three four cycles, the first of which I had just drawn on the previous slide, um, would actually carry a, an octahedron with uh, the four cycle as its equator. So I drew one half of an octahedron before. If I had reversed the orientation and started off with, uh, with J times I instead of uh, I times J, I would have output negative K and then the southern pole of the octahedron I was drawing would be um, negative K and the north pole would be positive K. So for instance, uh, let's see, I, J minus I minus J. This four cycle then is like the um, equator of an octahedron, which has the output vertices, um, positive K and negative K as, um, as, its, uh, as its poles. So something like this, if you can imagine that that's an octahedron. <laughs> Um, and similarly, the other two four cycles also carry such an octahedron, where the output vertices would be plus or minus i and plus or minus j for the other two um, four cycles. So it's hard to draw this because it's actually like three octahedra or three two spheres, each pair of which is glued along a pair of vertices. So it's, it's not a manifold, it's some singular two pseudo manifold. But okay. So um, this is the complex which Herman and Pachyanathan called XQ8 for the quaternion group Q8. Um, I just called it G here. And we'll call this complex SIMG, the simplicization of G. And it consists of three two spheres, each pair of which is glued at two points, as I just said. Now, if we remove these points, then we'll get the disjoint union of three two spheres, each of which are, um, are missing some points. And um, if we then fill in those holes, we'll just get three two spheres. Um, so we had this sort of singular mess before. And if we delete each of those pairs of points, each of those vertices where the um, some uh, where these uh, octahedra are glued together, we'll just get the disjoint union of three two spheres, which are no longer glued to each other. And this is what we will call the serenation of the group G. And Herman and Pachyanathan called the desingularized complex Y of Q8. Um, but okay. So um, that's sort of an informal description of what Herman and Pachyanathan did. Um, we have a lot more work to do because we both need to uh, soup up the algebra a lot to get n-dimensional things that will behave appropriately in the way that groups do. And also we need to figure out what desingularizing an n-dimensional pseudo-manifold means. Um, neither of which have been done to my knowledge prior to this. Um, although the desingularization, I wouldn't be that surprised about, but I at least wasn't capable of finding, <laughs> finding that. Um, okay. I mean, in the literature. Okay. So what are the algebraic things that will play the uh, analogous role to, um, to uh, groups? They're quasi groups. So a quasi group is a magma or a set equipped to the binary operation um, where 
essentially where division is always defined or where the multiplication table is given by a Latin square. So if you fix any two of X, Y, and Z, then you can always find one unique, there exists a unique solution to the equation F of X, Y equals Z, where F is this quasi-group multiplication. So all groups are quasi-groups, but quasi-groups don't have to have identities or be associative. They're typically, they typically don't have those things. And um, for some examples, well, okay, besides that all, all groups are quasi-groups, so we know those examples already. Um, but the midpoint operation, say on Rn, where you average um, two points, X and Y and Rn, that's a quasi-group operation, which is not associative um, and which doesn't have an identity. Um, and the uh, magma, the integer is equipped with subtraction is also a quasi-group, but it's not associative. Okay. So we now have a second equivalent definition of a quasi-group, which is that it's a set A equipped with three binary operations, the first of which we think of as multiplication and the second two of which we think of as, as the left and right division, um, where the following four equations must hold. And so um, this is actually equivalent to the original definition. If you have the multiplication F, you can produce G1 and G2 uniquely. If you have this object, obviously you can forget the G1 and G2 and F is the same quasi-group multiplication we had before. And so we'll think of G1 of XY as dividing Y by X in the second coordinate or like on the right. Um, the reason why G1 of XY is like dividing in the second coordinate is because um, when we look at the n, n area analog of this, we'll find that that's um, the appropriate uh, notation so that this generalizes nicely. So that's just a little awkwardness for the n equals two case. But um, so what's nice about this equational definition is that uh, the class of all binary quasi groups can actually be defined by universally quantified equations or identities. And so in universal algebra, this means that uh, quas2, the class of binary quasi-groups, is a variety of algebras. Um, other varieties of algebras include groups and rings, and they tend to be very nice, the very nice categories of algebraic structures, which have themselves a lot of structure. So there's then a category, bold quas2, which um, consists of all quasi-groups with their usual homomorphisms, um, and this category will necessarily be closed under taking quotients, subalgebras, and products. So we can do a lot of familiar algebra, just like we would with groups, with quasi-groups. And um, Herman and Pachyanathan's construction actually works with non-commutative quasi-groups just as well as groups. If you sort of look at what we did before, you'll find that you'll have no problems producing um, two pseudo-manifolds from non-commutative quasi-groups in the same manner as I described for the quaternion group. The associativity doesn't actually, isn't a necessary thing to do that part of the construction. Um, so what we would like is an n-ary version of a quasi-group for our n-dimensional generalization, because if I had some n-ary version of a quasi-group operation, I could then um, build a simplicial complex by taking simplices um, to be, say, three simplices, like this, if I could draw three simplex, <laughs> where we would have, say, x1 as an input vertex, x2 as an input vertex, x3 as an input vertex, and then an output vertex f of x1 x2, x3. And uh, those quasi-group properties would say that um, we had uh, we had uh, gluing that we would want to get a pseudo-manifold, except for one thing that I will address in a minute. <laughs> okay, but basically that's the correct idea. So um, we can define n quasi-groups analogously to how we could define um, uh, how we could define uh, quasi-groups in the binary case, um, either by a single n operation, um, which is essentially a Latin n cube operation, or um, we could define it by equations. I realize now I have five minutes, right? So I have to go very fast if I want to get to, okay. So maybe this is not a 25 minute talk to you, um, but it'll be okay. So um, these guys are the correct algebraic structures to use. And um, we're going to say that they're commutative. If you can permute all of the entries um, in a tuple and get the same output, 
We're going to say they're alternating if you can permute entries by elements of the alternating group and get the same output. And so, um, so here, uh, this is the correct analog of, um, an, of a group would be an alternating quasi group, which is not um, commutative in the NRE sense. Okay. And so um, a lot of general theory applies to these very well because there are also varieties of algebras. And so we tediously found a single example by hand whose elements come from Z mod 5Z. Um, you allow Z mod 5Z and the alternating group on three letters to act on the set of tuples from Z mod 5, triples from Z mod 5Z in a certain way. Um, and then essentially ex define the multiplication this way on orbit representatives and extend by that action. This is not a very general example. This is a single five element example that was actually pretty um, tedious to find, but we found it. Um, Jonathan Smith um, also gave us an example which we generalized into a much more systematic um, construction, um, but I won't talk about that now. So in any case, we know that these things exist. There are non-trivial examples and um, we can manufacture manifolds from them in the following manner. So first of all, um, to each, um, say, ternary or nary alternating quasi group, we can assign a simplicial complex, the simplicization that I had mentioned before. Um, and we're going to define that um, to, oh, that's missing parentheses. We're going to define that by um, considering all of the non-commuting n tuples, a1 through an, of elements of our quasi group, um, so that um, the image of that tuple um, under the quasi group operation is um, changed if you permute two of the, if you just swap two of the entries. Um, so that's essentially what it means to be non commuting. And um, then we define the input and output vertices analogously to what I had discussed um, before in the binary example. So then um, we make the same complex I talked about before, where the facets are these um, collections of n input vertices and an output vertex. Okay, and then we have the simplic simplicization uh, pseudo manifold. And then uh, what we're going to do is um, we're going to form a collection of charts whose domain is this um, is this bi pyramid that I mentioned here. Um, and uh, here's the first of two types of um, smooth charts that we can put um, put on these things. Um, Figuring out this formula is essentially a linear algebra and high school geometry exercise, which you can see in the paper. Um, and so from that, if we take the essentially the all but this is like the all but n minus two skeleton of the geometric realization of the simplicization of the quasi group that you started with, then those charts that I had just written down before will actually give you a smooth atlas on that um, space. It's not um, it's not a sub manifold of the smooth manifold, um, the ambient real smooth manifold, but it's from the geometric realization, but it, it is a smooth manifold. And, um, and so then uh, I have some examples here where for the example ternary quasi group that I mentioned, um, this is the incidence graph of the facets, and this is the one skeleton of it. And so it turns out that in that case, um, the open serenation is actually the three sphere minus this graph, which is homotopy equivalent to the join of 21 circles. And so um, then we can perform a, this last stage of the construction, the desingularization, by essentially taking the geometric realization of that open serenation and, um, and then um, forming the metric completion with respect to a naturally functorially occurring Ramanian metric on that space and then taking all the points in that metric completion, which are locally Euclidean. This will essentially remove singularities and fill in holes in the appropriate manner. Um, so if we do that, then we'll actually get the three sphere as the serenation of that example manifold I gave before. So now in one minute, how do you make all of the other manifolds that aren't the three sphere? Okay, so I should give you a theorem, right? This is a talk in which I should give you a theorem. So. We'll say that an n-manifold is serene when it's a component of one of these constructions that I just described. And so our theorem is that every connected orientable triangulable n-manifold is serene. And so basically what you do is you take your manifold, okay, I have less than a minute, take your manifold, consider a triangulation, 
So say it's a two manifold and the triangulation looks like this, A, um, B, C, then subdivide by including a new vertex in the center and then declare this vertex to be the image of A and B under some operation and that should be the same as the image of B and C and so on and so forth in an oriented manner. And if you do this, then because the class of alternating quasi groups is a variety, you will actually be able to form a free alternating quasi group on the appropriate set of elements and take a quotient to manufacture the thing that you want. Okay, so um, that's very vague, but that's essentially the picture. Um, and uh, Yes, so um, thank you very much. And I hope that uh, you didn't feel it was too rushed, but um, that does describe all possible orientable, triangular, and manifolds. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you. All right, thank you.